But we're back at church, we're back looking at our Bibles. Let's return to our Liberty and Legalism series. I want to look at a topic today uh, with, with great purpose because as we go through this Liberty and Legalism series, we're trying to def make sure our stance is not one of legalism or of abusing liberty. We're trying to make sure we are right on God's Word, right? Not beyond it, not short of it, but right on God's Word. I had a man this like last week gave me a compliment, and I think it was the best compliment I've heard, and it wasn't from a man who I've had a lot of scriptural fellowship with, but he said, he said, one thing my wife and I appreciate about you is that you always just, uh, you always preach what's in the Bible. Uh, every, every point you make, you back it up with scripture, and we appreciate that. I was like, I said, thanks. I said, yeah, I wouldn't want to stand anywhere else. I wouldn't want to make a point that's not in the Bible. That's dangerous ground. That's when the world can get mad at you and God can get mad at you at the same time. I don't want that. I'm okay with the world getting mad at me, but it's not, let, it's not God getting mad at me. So we try to stay right on God's word. But I will tell you, today I want to cover a topic where, where the world does get very mad at us. In fact, the world and many Christians would call us a church legalist. And some of you might know where this is going, but our church doesn't get called legalistic many times, except on one issue. One issue, and that, mar that, that issue is marriage. Our stance on marriage, some Christians call it legalistic, right? So legalistic is we are imposing a man-made standard on people. But I want to address that today, look a little bit at that. Um, and we'll do it in this series. I think we needed to cover marriage at some point in this series anyways. We talk about what is uh, lawful and what is, what is a man-made restriction. So why does our church get this label from some as legalistic on the topic of marriage? Well, in short, and this whole lesson is going to be abbreviated, you could really study this in many different ways, but we get called legalistic on the topic of marriage because we hold the position, we hold the position, and I trust many of you are in full agreement with me, that marriage is until death. And we believe that in truth. Many websites will say, say well, we, we as a church, we believe that God intended for marriage to be until death. No, I believe marriage is until death. It's right there. People say we're legalistic because we take the Bible at its word. We also believe in that same sentence, because it is both logical and scriptural, that marriage is until death without exception. And with that phrase, people say, wait, you guys are legalistic. There has to be an exception. And probably one of the greatest exceptions or the most popular exceptions out there is if someone cheats on their spouse, then should they not be allowed to divorce their spouse and marry another? About 99% of pastors and churches today will say, yeah, that's an exception. If they get cheated on, they can go marry somebody else. I say, no, I don't see that in Scripture. And that's where they say, you're a legalist. Don't you love these people? Don't you love these people? By the way, we won't talk about this much, but when every emotional arguments come in, they're, they're weak arguments, right? Because you could say, well, I do love the people. I love the kids so much that you two should work it out, right? I love you two so much that you should stay with the original spouse, the one you said you love, the one you said you'd be with until death anyways. So I'm not going to cover all these passages, but why I believe, and this church stands on marriage being unto death without exception, is because of passages like Mark 10, Luke 16, Romans 7, 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 5, Genesis Malachi, these passages teaching that marriage is until death without, and it never names any exception whatsoever. It doesn't even hint at an exception. This is why I stand on this. Another reason is because when Christ came, about 1800, 1900 years pass, and everybody believed that marriage was until death, and divorce and remarriage did not even exist across the world and in our nation for those centuries after centuries. It never existed. Were all those people legalists all those years? 
That's what we have to ask ourselves. That's what we have to ask ourselves. The Bible has much, much, much to say on marriage, and I encourage you, if you're interested in it, search our website, search YouTube. We have a lot of videos. I did, we did a whole series on marriage. Um, I forget how many parts, many parts about marriage. Please look it up. Learn about it, because marriage is something that impacts every one of us. If you're married, it's important for you to understand that marriage is until death. If you have kids, if you have loved ones, encourage them to marry wisely. Encourage them to reconcile. Encourage them to forgive. Because God made marriage until death. But today, let's just focus on one book. And let's focus on the one book that some say proves there is an exception for marriage not being under death, that proves that if someone cheats, then that marriage is done, is called off, is over. So today, let's just focus on one book. That book would be Matthew. Let's see from the book of Matthew what we can learn about marriage. As we continue our liberty and legalism series, let's look for what's a legalistic belief on marriage and what is a biblical belief on marriage. Let's start in chapter 1. Let's start with this one. And while much of what I'm about to say, I will say is defensible, this first point is not defensible. There is a belief among, I hope it's dissipating, but when I grew up in Baptist circles, there was a belief regarding marriage that people of different ethnicities should not marry. In fact, uh, Peter Ruckman was a strong proponent of this. Ruckmanite churches, maybe they still believe this, but Peter Ruckman said that race mixers are mentally sick. Right, so whatever, you've got some, some dude from Ireland marries a girl from Asia that's mentally sick, right? Or someone from Africa marries someone from Asia mentally sick. That's what they taught. And I'm sad to say that in the circles I grew up with, there, that thought was there. You shouldn't do it. It's stupidity is what it is. That is a legalistic view about marriage. How do we know that? Well, what does the Bible say? We can find an answer to that right here in Matthew chapter 1. Now, Matthew is a wonderful book. It was written to the Jews, so it has a lot of Jewish um, specifics, including this line of Christ. It tells us the genealogy of Christ. Look at Matthew 1, verse 1. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew writes to this Jewish audience knowing that they would appreciate this Jewish line that points all the way to the Savior. They would know all these names. So this is the line of Christ. Now look down in this line of Christ. Look at verse 5. It says, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rachab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and then of course Jesse begat David. You know David's in the line of Christ. But look at those inside verse 5 alone. There are two Gentiles. In verse 5 alone, there's a whole lot of race mixing going on. Look at that um, Boaz of Rachab. That is Rahab. That is the Canaanite, right? And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. Now, Ruth was a what? A Moabitess, another Gentile. So we can say already, we can put a stamp right there that that belief against race mixing, which is a dumb term anyways. I don't like to use the term race. That's an evolutionary term. But race mixing is a legalistic um, view. It's okay. The instructions the Bible gives us, we should pray about who we marry. If you're a Christian, you should marry somebody who is a Christian, but sometimes we make mistakes, but then you stay together anyways. 1 Corinthians 7 tells us that. But it does not matter what ethnicity your spouse is. Let's look now at Matthew 1 and verse 18. We're learning from the book of Matthew today. I think we'll learn some new things maybe. Look at 1, 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now one part of marriage that it was true in Bible times and is true today is this espousal period. For the Jews, they called this a betrothal period. Today, you might call this an engagement period. We have this. This has been in history for, for many years. This is what Mary and Joseph are in right now. It says, it says before they came together. So they're not married yet. They're in this espousal period. So what can we learn from this text? I think an engagement period is biblical. 
some people make different statements about you shouldn't have a long engagement and whatever, but maybe there's wisdom in that. But overall, I think an engagement period is biblical. You say you're going to commit to a, a marriage, right? And you're planning towards that. It makes a statement that this is my future spouse, okay? Off limits. This is, this is set in stone a little bit. Um, it's a biblical thing. During this time, they're not married and they don't have relations, okay? Today we use, uh, you'll see in this text, it'll, keep, it'll call Mary the wife, it'll call Joseph the husband, calls them husband and wife. They didn't have the French term fiancé back then, okay? So they just used the term husband and wife. Today we would call each other, this is my fiancé. Um, the, Jewish, the Jewish people, again, would call this the betrothal period. And you can learn about the betrothal period in Deuteronomy 22. But look at 19. Something happens here during this period. And just said that Mary was found with child. Then in verse 19 it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. <coughs> so what happens here is Mary got pregnant. And Joseph gets worried. See, back in these days, in these biblical days, in fact, about 100 years ago, it used to be a shameful thing to have relations outside of marriage. Today, it's the norm, isn't it? People are having relations all the time. Um, and then child, children come, and, well, I'm just glad they don't abort them. But children come, some people then decide, okay, now we'll get married. I'm glad. But the, still, the rule is you shouldn't have been having relations in the first place. That's the biblical way. That's not legalism to say stop sleeping around before you're married. That's, that's Bible. Sleeping around before you're married is called fornication. It's not supposed to happen. It is. It always was viewed as a shameful thing. Today, it's it's a norm. It's a, a norm, but that's not what it should be a norm. So you know, the Jewish people they took fornication and they took virginity very seriously during the betrothal period. For, for the Jewish people, during this betrothal period, this espousal period, if a bride was discovered to not be a virgin, the husband could put her away. In fact, in, in Jewish custom, that was the only reason they could call off the marriage, was if the woman was found to not be a virgin. They had a high standard. So once they said, hey, we're betrothed, they were locked in. Not marriage, but still a very strong engagement. Today, when we engage, we don't make it that strong. People walk away from marriages sometimes. Sometimes they walk away on the very wedding day. They don't show up. But for the Jews, they took it seriously. We've made a strong commitment here. We're only going to call it off if the person's not a virgin. Right? If we have indication then that fornication has been committed. Those rules in Deuter that I referenced in Deuteronomy 22, they're so strict that if the man, so if the husband falsely accused the wife of not being a virgin, like she said, I, got, I thought I married a virgin, but she wasn't, and found out that he false accu falsely accused her. And you can read about this in Deuteronomy 22. They had this, the tokens of virginity to see if the, uh, the wife was actually a virgin. But if the man falsely accused, he'd be in huge trouble. Let me read uh, to you Deuteronomy 22, 18 and 19 says, And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. So if this man falsely accused, he'd have to pay the father money for having hurt their reputation. It's a big deal for the Jewish people. Also, you note there that line, even in Deuteronomy, in the Mosaic Law, says, couldn't put away all his days, marriage being unto death. More evidence of that. Okay, but track with me now here. Joseph finds that, she, that she's pregnant, and he wants to put her away. He wants to do it privately. I not want to embarrass her, but he just wants to put her away, and he would be allowed to do that. Marriage hasn't even been um, um, made yet. They're still in this espousal period. Look at verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. See, he still hasn't taken her. He's, about, he's going to take her as his wife. God says, go ahead and do it. This child's of the Holy Spirit. Okay? 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Now all this was done. Excuse me. 
fighting a little cold today, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Wonderful passage quoting there from the book of Isaiah. Look at 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. So he went ahead with the marriage. Okay, he could have called it off because of that fornication, but he proceeded with the marriage. Look at 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So Joseph didn't have relations with Mary until they got married. Which, by the way, is a rebuke to Catholicism, thinking that Mary is a perpetual virgin. No, eventually he did. He knew her. I mean, they had other children which are named in scripture. Right there is a proof text that Catholicism is crazy. But I hope it helps us understand marriage a little bit. If we think about Jewish and Jewish betrothal, we think, well, that's like really, that's like out there. I can't wrap my head around it. It's not a far cry from what we see today. For the Jews, it was just a prerequisite. Joseph says, I'm going to marry a virgin. He found out she's not a virgin. He was allowed to call the whole thing off. Okay? It's kind of, I use the example today, although I don't know if it's the best example, but the concept is, is entering into marriage under a false pretense. Like I would, if someone told me this, and it actually may be happening today more than I think, but if you thought you were marrying a female, right, and you found out on your wedding night that actually you, this wasn't a female, I actually think you'd have biblical stand to say, no, uh, 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 I did not sign up for this. Call off the marriage. I think you'd have every right to do that. It'd be a false pretense. For the Jews, they treated virginity that seriously. If a person wasn't a virgin, they'd call it off. Okay. Let's move forward now to Matthew 5. Keep in your head some of those things. This will get to that point of, of, of this exception. And people say, well, what if someone cheats, right? Can you end a marriage? Well, so far we see what Joseph did was he had a right to call off the marriage. The marriage had not begun, right? This was all fornication. This is all pre-marriage pre during the espousal period. I look at <coughs> Matthew 5. Now, this passage is a Sermon on the Mount. And to be honest, I don't read it a whole lot when I talk about marriage. Um, but it's got some wonderful nuggets here. If you, just, if you had just one book, I think you could understand what marriage is through any book. Some say Matthew's the most difficult because it mentions some of these Jewish intricacies. But if you just read Matthew straight through, it explains it to you as, as you go. You see the story of Joseph. Now, look here what it says in Matthew 5, not long after... Um, um, what we just read there, but look at 531. This is the Sermon on the Mount. I love that Jesus saw fit and all the important truths he shares in the Sermon on the Mount. He also shares these truths about marriage. 531. He says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Look at these verses. We can learn a lot right here. First note, look at verse 31. Look at the first four words. Jesus says, it hath been said. And then look at verse 32. Look at the first five words. But I say unto you. You'll see this when Jesus talks, whenever he talks about the topic of divorce. The truth is, God made marriage, man made divorce. So whenever he speaks of divorce, I believe it, it's not even in God's vernacular. It's not even in God's concepts of impact on marriage. It's something mankind made up. And we know from other passages, and we'll see, it, we'll see later on, that Moses implemented this rule to govern hard-hearted people. Right? It was something God allowed. God's like, Moses, somehow you've got to keep the people from getting you know, crazy and, and got to organize them somehow. So just make, go for it. It's fine. But it's not God's rule. See the difference. It hath been said. Then he says, but I say unto you. So under Moses' rule in verse 31, it was lawful to put away your wife. You could write this divorcement out. Today, that's what people have today, right? We say, oh, it's lawful. You go down to the judge, you fill out the divorce papers, and it's lawful. But we're, we're making the same mistake that Jesus is rebuking here. 
32 says, but I say Christians should be interested in what God says on the topic of marriage, not on the topic, or not on what that divorce paper says. God created marriage, mankind created divorce. The, the, the rules for um, the Mosaic laws for marriage, you can find these in Deuteronomy 24 if you want to do a deeper study. The Mosaic laws for marriage are in Deuteronomy 24 and actually they're quite different from God's laws. Just studying that alone will, will help you understand this. Under the Mosaic laws for marriage, Mosaic meaning Moses, Mosaic laws for marriage, um, it states that one, you could end a marriage, and two, you could never reconcile. You know that under the Mosaic Laws? You could end a marriage, and if you ended that marriage, you could never go back to your spouse, your original spouse. Do you know that's the opposite of God's law for marriage? God's law for marriage is, one, marriage is until death, so you can never end it, and two, always reconcile. You get in arguments, you get in fights, someone messes up, you always reconcile. A neat passage to reference is Jeremiah 3.1. It says something similar. You can kind of see God's voice has never changed through all the ages. Jeremiah 3.1 says, God says, they say, Right? Again, he's saying mankind says, Moses says, if they say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? And he says, but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. God says, man's rule is don't ever reconcile. God says, my rule is Reconcile, return, return. Even though you were unfaithful, return, return. People point to God all the time like, well, well, it says in the prophets that God got divorced. He uses that language to show how severe people mess up, right? People have been terribly, terribly unfaithful. And the, the Jewish people are terribly unfaithful to God. So you will find passages that God say, so I put you from me. But in the very same passages in Jeremiah and 3, he says, Yet I am still married to you, and be reconciled to me. It's so using God as the model for marriage or as an excuse to walk away from your spouse and never return. It's a bad model because God's model is reconciliation despite great unfaithfulness. Look at verse 32 now. But I say unto you, now this is God's rule, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, now we'll come back to that, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now that line, saving for the cause of fornication, it, it, it means except for the cause of fornication. It's only found in Matthew. It's only found here in the book of Matthew. The other passages don't list it. And some say, well, why does it, why? Why is it only here? I believe it's clear. It's because it's dealing with something that's, that's really important to the Jewish people. The Jewish people. What if someone comes under a false pretense of being a virgin and they're not? I believe that's why it's here. And I believe that's why you don't see it anywhere else. So the recipients of Mark's gospel or of Luke or of Paul's audience to all the churches, he never references a single exception. Not one. I've told some of my detractors and some people who call me a legalist, I've said, if, if you saw this rule like repeated and explained by Paul, right, and Mark and Luke to all the Gentile people, I might give some more thought to it. But it's only here. So you got to ask, why is it here? Okay? Let's look at this verse in detail. So, he say, but I say. So this is his rule. And his rule is really clear. It says, whosoever puts away his wife causeth her to commit adultery. Think about that. So Pat puts away his wife, heaven forbid, He's made this decision, I'm, I'm done with it, for whatever the reason. I don't know, she burnt the pizza the final time. Actually, that's kind of a joke. My wife burns the pizza a lot. If that were allowed, I'd be able to get out right now. Okay. But then what you'd be doing is she would go find some other man. She would be committing adultery with that man. And you'd be a lot to blame because you're the one that told her to go away in the first place. Right? But now she's committing adultery with somebody else. This happens all the time. Jesus says it's wrong. Adultery is wrong. By the way, adultery is that word. Now, remember that word. There's two different words. Fornication and adultery. Adultery is that sin 
of a married person. Note the difference. And then we'll note the difference in this verse. And look, it also says, And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So say that some quote unquote innocent Joe Blow comes up and is like, Hey, Sandra's single, I'll marry her. Well, now Pat's created a huge problem because now he's also committing adultery. He's bought into this lie of the land that somehow she's free to marry. She's not. She's still Pat's wife. This is America in a nutshell. Everybody's put away their spouses, and then some other yehu comes along like, oh, I guess you're free to marry. No, they're not. And then the worst part is they, they start living together, and they have kids, and then, well, this legitimizes it all. No, it's still, it's still adultery. You just made it a lot harder now. So well, what about the kids from the second marriage? Well, what about the kids from the first marriage? <coughs> There's a lot to unpack here, a lot to preach on, and you know I do my best to preach on it. So look, a lot of sin happening because of this putting away that should never happen. So, but it, he does say there's an exception. He says, saving for the cause of fornication. So you could put away a wife in a lawful way and avoid all this. So now let's think about this. What happened with Joseph and Mary? Joseph found Mary, he thought she had committed what? Fornication. He thought she had slept around during that betrothal period or prior to it. And he would have been lawful putting her away. Right? She had, that marriage would have been done. She would, have never been, she would not have been known as Joseph's wife. Right? She actually would have been um, able to marry. At some point, he would have been able to marry. That whole thing was nullified. Right? If that was the case. He found her in fornication and put her away for that. But the key word here key word is fornication. This is not the sin of adultery. All the world today wants to tell you saving for the cause of adultery. That's how they preach it. Well, you know, Barb, Barbara, she cheated on Tim. Tim's heartbroken. So he filed the divorce papers and the pastor said he should. Right now, Tim's, Tim's allowed to go marry somebody else. Barbara isn't, which is another made up idea. There's nothing that says that. It's made up. But they're, what they're looking for is for the sin of adultery. By the way, the King James is very specific in its use of the word fornication. Some of these new versions, if you read the NIV, it might even be the one that says marital unfaithfulness, which there's no way to get that definition from the word pornea. There's no way to make that. Pornea very specifically, specifically means fornication. We'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? But it says here... For the sin of fornication. It was that sin that's talking about, you see, it, it's seen talking about in Matthew chapter 1. If the woman had come under the false pretense of being a virgin, you discover that she's not a virgin. She had committed fornication quite clearly because she's not a virgin. You are allowed to put her away. The Jewish people, this was very important to them. People ask me today, well, what about today? If you thought you were marrying a virgin and you actually found out years later that they actually had relations. I've met people actually try to tell me this before. And I was like, was that really your thought process? Was, it, was your whole marriage hinging on this? I, I doubt that was in your custom or in your, even your brain at all at the, of why you did this. Um, but for the Jewish people, it was that entering into a contract under a true pretense. And for them, it matters. Okay, let's look now. Let's go forward in the book some more. Let's talk about that word, because really it does come down to this word. People tell me all the time, there's, a, there's an excuse in the Bible to get remarried, and you're a legalist for not letting us do it. Well, it comes down to this one word, fornication, right, in this one book of Matthew. Let's look. Thankfully, in the book of Matthew, it uses... It lists this thing, this um, phrase twice. It's in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. Before you get to Matthew 19, look at Matthew 15. <coughs> so if you only had the book of Matthew to go on, which thankfully we don't, you can read the rest of the Bible and confirm that marriage is until death really clearly. But if you, if you only had Matthew, I think you'd come to the same conclusion. Look at Matthew 15, 19. 
Well, I come to the conclusion, say, well, Logan, I'm struggling with that definition fornication. I mean, I, looked, I just Googled the word fornication right now in my 2024 dictionary, and it looks like fornication, one of its sub-meanings, can mean adultery. Well, that's a poor way to define words. First, we should define words uh, based on biblical usage and based on biblical context. And then beyond that, find an older dictionary because our English language is degrading and degrading fast. Just look up the word sodomy and you'll get a quick picture of what I mean on that. Well, maybe don't. But sodomy, that word has been degraded, something that's far removed from the Bible. So now when you say it today, people don't understand what you're rebuking. The devil does these things on purpose. Look at Matthew 15 and verse 19. Jesus tells us, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. The point here is Jesus Christ lists the sin of adulteries and fornications separately. They are separate sins. If they are the same sin, if they are synonyms, there's no reason to list them twice. And this is the pattern throughout Scripture. Whether in 1 Corinthians, whether you're in the book of Jeremiah, whether you're in the book of Deuteronomy, it says there's fornication and adultery. The Old Testament often says there's, there's um, whoremongering or an, and adultery, right? Two different phrases for two different sins. They're not the same word. To my point about older dictionaries, one time someone was challenging me on this. They said, Logan, you're, you're a legalist. I think that word fornication means all kinds of things. Which, by the way, that's where it's at now. I said the marital unfaithfulness is in some, some Bibles. Some Bibles are also changing it to um, sexual immorality. So I have heard people say, well, my, my husband is doing pornography. Jesus told us, you look on a woman to lust, it's adultery in your heart, so I have a legal grounds to divorce my husband, right? Do you see how this is a slippery slope? Pretty soon anything goes. But some versions not only say sexual immorality, they just say just more of a loose immorality, right? So you see your husband cussed at the dog is also reason to divorce him. The devil wants this, because the devil wants marriages to break up. He wants shattered homes. He wants kids around some perverted stephusband, right, stepfather. The devil wants to destroy homes. God was very purposeful with making marriage. It represents Christ, right, the oneness of believers in Christ. It also is a stabilizer in society. How can a godless world have any stability at all? Like a godless nation have any stability at all? How can society progress from one generation to another? Marriage. Even godless nations have had this. They've at least had a strong home where mom and dad stayed together. They raised about 10 kids and boom, you got another generation of people. Two different sins. Remember that. Adultery is fornication. Let me read just some dictionaries. I, I did some heavy research on this back when I was challenged on this because I noticed everybody was arriving at the NIV's definition and reading definitions from 2020. Did you know that every English dictionary, every single English dictionary within 110 years of the KJV translation, that's 1611, 16, every dictionary within 110 years defined fornication as sex between single people. And I, one time a pastor challenged me. He's like, does it actually say single people? You're making that up. Because it defines it really squarely, doesn't it? Let me read to you. Edmund Coots, 1596 dictionary says, fornication is uncleanness between single persons. Okay, so, and that, so what we're talking about here is something between a single person, not a married person. Robert Codry's 1604 Dictionary, which actually you can still buy. You can buy it online. It's, it's short, not a lot there, but I have one. 1604 Dictionary says, fornication is uncleanness between single persons. When I was studying this, when I was challenged on this in my life, 
I had the Bible. I already knew what these definitions were. You can see it from Scripture. People look up, well, look at this. There, here's maybe where it might be used as, fornication might be used as a broader term. They struggle, they struggle, they struggle. There's nothing definitive they can ever find. But then I started looking at these definitions, and I was like, wow, I see where the devil has gone with this. Opening up that, this exception to ruin marriages and make an excuse for people to swap partners all they want. Thomas Blount's 1656 um, dictionary. And this is when you start getting into like law and how they make their laws. It defines fornication as whoredom spoken of single persons. If either party be married, then tis adultery. You want to look at legal definitions, like how they would define things um, in our history and jurisprudence? That was always the case. Legal definition of fornication is among single persons, adultery among married persons or involving married persons. It matches God's word. You'd have to want to find an excuse for sin to get around this. Our stance is not legalistic. It's what the Bible teaches. Now, let's look at Matthew 18. Before we get to Matthew 19 to round it out. Matthew 18 has about everything you'd ever need on this topic. As long as you want to study God's word a little bit. People, I, I talk to people, saying, well, you're making up that whole betrothal period stuff. And that's Matthew chapter 1. It's Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's Bible. Just study your Bible. Right? You're making up that definition about fornication. It's the same thing as adultery. No, it's not. Listed side by side. God doesn't do that. Look, if you look back at that passage, sorry to digress, but look at Matthew 15, 19. We could say, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders and killings, right? Adulteries, fornication, thefts and stealings false witness and lying it would just be redundant if they mean the same thing they are different sins and that's Christ's mouth here that's his mouth his words and it's the same thing here so when he inserted the word fornication into chapter 5 it was on purpose and when he uses the word fornication chapter 19 it's on purpose but before we get there what should happen what should happen because this is the emotional question I get time and time again and I, I grant you, the emotional part of it is hard. Here's the question. Well, what if the spouse cheats? It, it would be heartbreaking to go through that. I don't deny that. It would be absolutely heartbreaking if your spouse cheated. And what about, not just once, but twice? Boy, that would be like double the pain, wouldn't it? You made the mistake once, then you did it again. Boy, you don't love me at all. I get the emotional side of it. I'm right with you. I'm married. I get it. So what if they cheat once? What if they cheat twice? What if they cheat eight times? I heard one guy's like, my wife cheated eight times. What if they cheated 100 times? I believe in Matthew, you have the answer right here. Look at Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? That's a pretty high standard. Not a bad standard. 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I take great issue with pastors who say, yeah, you, you've given them enough chance. Now it's time just to break the whole thing up. Take your kids and move away. Right, we're not talking about physical abuse or violence or keeping yourself safe. We're just talking about people saying, I'm done forgiving you, which from this text says it should never happen. It should never happen. Forgive, forgive, forgive. That's Christ's rules. You say, we're Christians. We follow Christ. That's the rule for marriage. You know, it, Peter's not talking about something easy to forgive. He's talking about hard things to forgive. Obviously, someone offended him. He's been through some hard times. He says, how many times do I got to go through this again? Good morning. That's the rule. When you meet people going through marital problems, boy, don't tell them to pack up. Don't tell them, oh, yeah, give up on this one. You use Christ's pattern and say, forgive. Say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. Yeah, I don't exactly, but Christ does. 
And he said, forgive. Look at Matthew 19 now. We've got like three minutes, but we'll read it right in context. This is, of course, this is the chapter where a lot of people run and they'll run to that one verse and that one word. But if you read the whole chapter, boy, and especially if you read all the chapters prior, it just flows out and tells us that marriage is until death. Look at Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And remember, Christ already talked about this in chapter 5. He said, It is written, but I say. <laughs> it's the same context and the same way he's going to answer here. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? For, and said, For this cause shall man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Is it legalism to say that marriage should be between a man and a woman? No, it's not. We're all standing hard on that rule, aren't we? Watch 6. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Is it legalism to say that two become one? Married until death. No, that's what Christ says right here. We should stand on all the rules Christ gives us here. Let not man put asunder. These marriages should not be um, thrown away. Should, we shouldn't pretend like they are done. They are not done in the eyes of God. We cannot undo what God has declared. Look at verse 7. They say in him, Why did Moses then command to give a right in a divorce and to put her away? I love that question. That helps us understand why Deuteronomy 24 says what it says. I'm so thankful this is in our Bible. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Now what does that mean to you? They say, well, 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 why is it written that we can divorce? And God says, he did this because of your wicked hearts to manage you wicked people. But from the beginning, it was not so. It's not my rule, God says. Just like he said in Matthew 5, just like he says throughout the scriptures. 9, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, and I remember the verses we just read, become one flesh from the beginning of time, it is not so, Right now, verse nine is saying, "Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for adultery." Now, is that what it says? No, it says, "Except it be for marital unfaithfulness, except it be for whatever you want." No, it says, "Except it be for fornication." That sin that Joseph thought he saw, that sin described in Deuteronomy 22, that sin described in Matthew 15, fornication, that sin before marriage. And shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. That's the rule. And people like to look at this and say, well, see Christ here, he's saying there, there is an exception. See, there is this reason that you can have another wife. Watch, if that were the case, so the disciples respond in a very strange way. Watch the disciples' response. His disciples saying to him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Like, what if you marry that loser that cheats on you ten times? That would be no fun whatsoever. You're telling us we've got to stick it out and stick it out? Look at verse 11. But he said to them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. The question is, can you obey God's word? Some can't. Some want to obey on all kinds of things, except for when the sin hits their own lives. And they say, this one's too tough, let's make an exception. This is what the church has done. Church stands strong on all kinds of things. But on this one, let's make an exception for our sons and our daughters. For our pastors. Switch wives. Look at verse 12. Watch this legalism that Christ speaks of. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. What is Christ saying in verse 12? He's saying some people are going to have to remain single. For the kingdom of heaven's sake, for the obedience of the Bible's sake, they're going to have to stay eunuchs, right? That's what it teaches. I got called a legalist one time for that. I was like, so you're saying this person, you know, 
this person. They, they married poorly, right? And their, their, their spouse left them. You're saying they've got to stay single. They can never be happy again. They've got to be a eunuch their whole life. One person told me, it's like, those aren't my words. Those are Christ's words. Christ's words. So I will proudly stand with the legalist Christ, if that's what you want to call him while others can stand on this abuse of liberty. There is never liberty to sin. Grace is wonderful and grace is free, but grace is never an excuse to sin. People say, well, it's all under the blood. Yeah. It doesn't give the gay man an excuse to stay in a gay marriage. It doesn't give the adulterous man an excuse to stay in an adulterous marriage. This, my friends, on the topic of marriage is not legalism. It's the Bible. And this is, this is one area that we should not bend. When we talk about legalism, don't let them beat you down. The Bible is quite clear on this. If all these instructions about marriage weren't in the scriptures and we just made things up, then we could call it legalism. But the Bible is very clear on what marriage is, even in the book of Matthew, which many would say is is the most confusing or, you know, door-opening book of all. And it's not. It's a closed case. Christ is not a legalist. He's a lawgiver. Man made divorce. God made marriage. And marriage is until death. We can stand on that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for our Bible. Lord, I thank you that you gave us clarity on the topic of marriage. Lord, it's... it's, it's um, it's so abused today, divorce, remarriage. Pastors aren't standing for the truth. Pastors are encouraging people to get divorced and to get remarriage. We're encouraging people to sin, Lord. I know you're not happy about it. Lord, in Malachi, it tells us that you hate divorce. I know you're not happy, Lord, about this um, world we have, marriages ending, children in heartbreak, Lord, and then this, this piece of paper being some excuse to commit relations with some other person's spouse. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for this wickedness, Lord, that we've brought inside our churches, Lord, and now we're promoting to the people in the churches, Lord, and marriages are out of control, homes are out of control. Forgive us, help us stand on this, even against the, the accusation of being a legalist, Lord. Help us do um, nothing more than what the Bible says, Lord, but nothing less. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.